Hi, you can't hear me at all, can you? How, how would you even see out of this thing? Hi. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. And I thought we'd talk about whether this is copyright infringement on this. And what really should not be done about it. And along the way, I thought maybe we could learn something about substantial similarity and what the courts consider when they are trying to determine whether something like this is copyright infringement or not. And then maybe we'll get to a conclusion where this is really not copyright infringement. It's definitely not ethical, but it might not exactly be copyright infringement, and it's almost certainly not actionable. So join me. Stay tuned. Do we still use that these days? Keep your URL tuned to this station. So what's happened? This is a tweet that came from Xbox just, uh, I guess, two days ago at 5 p.m. Get lost in this year's best multiplayer experience. PUBG is now on Xbox One. And it's got this really kind of cool-looking advertisement where the PUBG guy is inside the, uh, the grass and the thing inside an Xbox and like the environment is around it. So it's, it's you know, it's like kind of a meta kind of thing. And it looks kind of cool. Until uh, you go back and look and see that uh, somebody had already made an ad like this about a month ago. I think this is a, a fan work, like a work of fan fiction, like user-generated content. And that's really interesting, because that looks an awful lot like that. And that is Microsoft's ad, and this is the original creation. An original creation that appears to have been created by somebody named Maxter. And he's not saying, and he or she is not saying they own any copyright, but the original post has 63,000 views. So I assume they saw it and Maxter got no credits. So that's a very interesting situation there. And I thought this was a great opportunity to go over substantial similarity and the test for copyright infringement. And so join me while we go over the case of Lou Shaw versus Richard Lindheim. This is a case from the late 90s over a television program in the late 70s. Lou Shaw and Eastbourne Productions appeal from a grant of summary judgment in favor of Richard Lindheim and three entertainment corporations. On appeal, Shaw argues that the district court erred in finding that, as a matter of law, there was no substantial similarity between his script, entitled The Equalizer, and defendant's pilot script for their Equalizer television series. Because a reasonable trier of fact could have found that the two works are substantially similar, Shaw argues, the district court erred in dismissing his copyright and Lanham Act claims on summary judgment. We reverse and remand. Now that means that the appeals court is reversing, is is changing, is is altering the lower court's opinion, saying that the lower court was wrong, and that means that there is substantial similarity between the works in this 1978 television series case. Let's go back. Lou Shaw is a well-known writer and producer in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. At one time during the 1976-77 television season, there were eight network television programs on the air that Shaw had created, written for, or produced. In February 78, Shaw entered into an option contract with Richard Lindheim, an executive in the dramatic programming division of NBC Television and granted NBC the option to develop The Equalizer, a pilot script created by Shaw, into a television series. Shaw delivered the script to Lindheim in July of 78. Lindheim read Shaw's script, NBC declined to produce it, and all rights reverted back to Shaw. Well, Lindheim then left NBC in 79 and began to work for Universal. In 81, Lindheim wrote a television series entitled The Equalizer. 
Lindheim admits that he copied the title of his treatment from Shaw's script. In 82, defendant Sloan expanded Lindheim's treatment and the revised version became the pilot script for defendant's Equalizer series, which was broadcast on CBS beginning in 85. In 87, Shaw filed an action for copyright infringement and unfair competition, alleging that defendant's pilot script and series were substantially similar to the script he had submitted. In 88, defendants moved for summary judgment, and later that year, the district court found that there was no substantial similarity between the two works as a matter of law, and granted summary judgment on Shaw's copyright and Lanham Act claims. Shaw timely appeals. We review a grant of summary judgment brand new. We have frequently affirmed summary judgment in favor of copyright defendants on the issue of substantial similarity. Where reasonable minds could differ on the issue of substantial similarity, however, summary judgment is improper. Copyright law protects an author's expression. Facts and ideas within a work are not protected. To establish a successful copyright infringement claim, Shaw must show that he owns the copyright and that defendant copied protected elements of the work. Because in most cases direct evidence of copying is not available, a plaintiff may establish copying by showing that the infringer had access to the work and that the two works are substantially similar. So going back to the PUBG Microsoft ad, do these two look substantially similar to you? Back to the Shaw case, the defendants conceded Shaw's ownership of the original Equalizer script and that they had access to the script for purposes of the summary judgment motion. As a result, the only issue before the district court on the copyright claim was whether defendants' version of the Equalizer is substantially similar. Any test for substantial similarity is necessarily imprecise. Upon any work, and especially upon a play, a great number of patterns of increasing generality will fit equally well, as more and more of the incident is left out. The last may perhaps be no more than the most general statement of what the play is about, and at times might consist only of its title, but there is a point in this series of abstractions where they are no longer protected, since otherwise the playwright could prevent the use of his ideas, to which, apart from their expression, his property is never extended. It is thus impossible to articulate a definitive demarcation that measures when the similarity between works involves copying a protected expression. Decisions must inevitably be ad hoc. That means that it's the court is saying it's impossible to make a, a written rule that applies to all cases equally and clearly shows what's substantially similar and what's not. Instead, decisions must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, we're in the Ninth Circuit here in this 1978-1990 case, and PUBG Microsoft is also, I think, in the Ninth Circuit. Let's take a look at the Croft framework. The Ninth Circuit employs a two-part test for determining whether one work is substantially similar to another. Established in Sid and Marty Croft Television Products v. McDonald's, the test permits a finding of infringement only if a plaintiff proves both substantial similarity of general ideas under the extrinsic test and substantial similarity of protectable expression of those ideas under the intrinsic test. Croft defined the extrinsic test as a test for similarity of ideas, the intrinsic test, then, should measure substantial similarity in expressions, depending on the response of the ordinary, reasonable person. It does not depend on the type of external criteria and analysis which marks the extrinsic test. Panels applying Croft to literary works have included a lengthy list of concrete elements under the extrinsic test. Whereas Croft listed the type of artwork involved, the materials used, the subject matter, and the setting for the subject as criteria for consideration under the extrinsic test, other court opinions have listed plot, themes, dialogue, mood, setting, pace, and sequence as extrinsic test criteria, as well as characters and sequence of events. Now that it includes virtually every element that may be considered concrete in a literary work, the extrinsic test, as applied to books, scripts, plays, and motion pictures, can no longer be seen as a test for mere similarity of ideas. 
because the criteria incorporated into the extrinsic test encompasses all objective manifestations of creativity, the two tests are more sensibly described as objective and subjective analyses of expression, having strayed from Croft's division between expression and ideas. A judicial determination under the intrinsic test is now virtually devoid of analyses, for the intrinsic test has become a mere subjective judgment as to whether two literary works are or are not similar. An example of how the absence of legal analysis may frustrate appellate review of the intrinsic test is the district court's order in this matter. The district court found, after extensive analysis, that reasonable minds might conclude that plaintiffs' and defendants' works were substantially similar as to the objective characteristics of theme, plot, sequence of events, characters, dialogue, setting, mood, and pace. Nevertheless, the court made a subjective determination under the intrinsic test that no reasonable juror could determine that the works had a substantially similar total concept and feel. The district court's decision to grant summary judgment solely on a subjective assessment under Croft's intrinsic test conflicts with the prescriptions of Croft. In Croft, this court stated that the outcome of the extrinsic test may often be decided as a matter of law. In contrast, if there is a substantial similarity in ideas, then the trier of fact must decide, under the intrinsic test, whether there is substantial similarity in the expressions of the ideas so as to constitute infringement. The intrinsic test for expression is uniquely suited for determination by the trier of fact. That's the jury. The trier of fact is the jury, unless the parties agree to a bench trial, where the judge becomes the trier of fact. Normally, the judge is only a judge of law, and the jury is the judge of fact. Professor Nimmer on copyright has also noted that the second step in the Croft analysis process requires that the trier of fact then decide whether there is substantial similarity in the expressions of the ideas so as to constitute infringement. The rule we announce today that satisfaction of the extrinsic test creates a triable issue of fact in a copyright action involving a literary work is in harmony with our prior decisions. By creating a discrete set of standards for determining the objective similarity of literary works, the law of this circuit has implicitly recognized the distinction between situations in which idea and expression merge in representational objects and those in which the idea is distinct from the written expression of a concept by a poet, a playwright, or a writer. Given the variety of possible expression and the objective criteria available under the extrinsic test to analyze a literary work's expression as distinct from the ideas embodied in it, the intrinsic test cannot be the sole basis for a grant of summary judgment. Once a court has established that a tribal question of objective similarity of expression exists, the inquiry should proceed no further. As noted earlier, a court applying the extrinsic test must compare the individual features of the works to find specific similarities between plot, theme, dialogue, mood, setting, pace, characters, and sequence of events. The test focuses not on basic plot ideas, which are not protected by copyright, but on the actual concrete elements that make up the total sequence of events and relationships between the major characters and the court goes on to analyze those things in great detail, which I will skip. And then the court goes on to conclude that there were enough similarities that it passes the objective test in favor of Shaw and sent it back. So now that you know a little bit more about the test for copyright substantial similarity, let's go back and take a look at these two. If we look at this first one, it has a white Xbox and the wheat field and the PUBG guy and the clouds in the background. And if we look at the second one, it has the black Xbox and the wheat field and the PUBG guy and the clouds in the background. It certainly looks substantially similar. I certainly can't say it's not substantially similar, but there's one more problem with this is that this is not an original copyright. This is definitely a really creative ad idea that, ca that a user came up with. But it looks like they use the PUBG guy and the PUBG wheat fields and the PUBG uh, like design for the gun and the backpack and everything. So 
it's really arguably user-generated content, and that's itself a copyright problem because doesn't Brandon Green and Microsoft uh, and Bluehole, don't they own the PUBG assets? And so if someone's using those to make a cool ad idea, what does prevent Microsoft or Brandon Green or Bluehole from using that ad idea to create their own ad? It's their own copyright material, and like we just saw, the idea is not protectable. It's only the expression. So I would say obviously Microsoft had access to this ad for the whole month before the their ad came out. So I don't think there's any, any question that they had access to it. It's whether or not in copying it, which I do think it is substantially similar, but that's best left up to a jury, or to you. We saw that it hit the front page of Reddit as one of the top posts. It was like 66,000 upvotes or something. That it was obviously something people considered to be substantially similar. I don't think there was any question there. But was there an underlying protectable copyright owned by Maxter in creating it that Microsoft could then like not use without permission? I don't think so. So I think that's where it fails. And so while it might be unethical of Microsoft, it might be terrible that they didn't use, you know, attribute their idea to its original author. Uh, this is not a copyright issue, I don't believe. So what do you think of that? Let me know. Share your outrage in the comments or, uh, or let me know what you think of my analysis. Uh, if you know what happened to Shaw v. Lindheim, I could not find the follow-up real quick here. I, didn't, I can't say that I tried really hard, but I couldn't find the follow-up real quick here, so I don't know exactly what, what happened after this case. So thank you for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I'd like to thank DJ Gilcrease for sponsoring a video in the month of December. I'll be doing the Impression Products versus Lexmark case for him. Thank you very much for that. My $50 plus supporters are John Steele, Lydia Collinson, Weston Loney, Gavin Barnard, The Godslain, and Sean McNamara. Thank you very much for your support, as well as the support of all the $5 plus supporters uh, scrolling on the LED panel behind me, and all the supporters who are supporting on Patreon. Thank you very, very much. We continue to suffer a little bit from the adpocalypse, but uh, we're figuring it out. It turns out moving the show off of YouTube, the live Sunday show, saved the YouTube channel. So we're going to go over that on the Sunday show as well. So thank you all for helping me through that. And I'll see you on the Sunday show. And we have some special stuff to talk about the state of the channel for the new year and all that. Again, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Have a great New Year's uh, Eve celebration and all that. Everybody stay safe. I love you all. And I'll see you soon in my next video. Oh shit, that's my rice.